It's all yours. Okay, so maybe I'll go for uh, 17 minutes now and then hand it off to, to Monica. So um, what I thought I'd do is spend a couple of minutes situating this because some of you have heard it several times and some of you have no idea what this is about. So the I think this is, as I was thinking about it uh, and thinking about the title that Greg uh, signed, I think this is the mother of all test reuse cases because there's test reuse. It looks like those windows that were going in the back, it's infinite text reuse. And the reason is uh, there's an original text uh, in the French in 1576. This is Baudin's uh, CD. Um, it gets six different French editions over something like 10 to 15 years. Uh, but 10 years in, so in 1586, it gets a Latin edition by uh, the author himself. I purposely use the term edition because it's not a translation, because he makes substantial changes, including rearranging uh, sections of the text, uh, removing sections of the text, and so on. Um, one thing which most of you, if not all of you, will know readily is that um, you already have uh, the, the kind of uh, language issues that present pedagogical and reuse opportunities just because you have French and Latin. So there will be words in French that are untranslatable in Latin and vice versa. And therefore, that's, that's an interesting thing for political theorists because it allows you to delve into meaning um, more deeply than you might otherwise be able to. Um, the, the, the story gets worse because uh, when the text gets translated into English, and let me try to find this. Um, when the text gets translated into English by Richard Knowles uh, in the beginning of the 17th century, um, he uses both the French and the Latin and produces um, a version that reads like neither. So I've chosen uh, one example from that edition, and this is from the very end. Um, and what I'm going to do is concentrate on these two passages in italics here. One is purportedly from Scripture, and the other is purportedly from Augustine. But I want to say something about uh, the kinds of problems that we're walking into. Um, so first of all, Baudin uses, uh, like all polymaths of his time, he uses a lot of Greek and Latin sources. Uh, he uses Hebrew. Uh, he often uses the original language. Uh, I've counted about 142 uh, original Greek passages. So that's not references to Greek texts. That's the actual passage in Greek characters printed in the French edition or printed in the Latin edition. Um, the, the, the great editor uh, of Baudin, uh, Douglas McRae uh, produced a facsimile edition of Knowles in the 60s, and since the 60s he has spent time tracing the references in the text. And as of a couple of years ago, that's 7,436 references, allusions, and examples. Um, and I just want to give a sense of what that census looks like. Sorry, this switching between windows is tiresome. Um, so he created this initially using index cards. Um, I guess this is what the numbers refer to. There's a reference in the text. Um, he gives you the pages in the original, and then he explains what the reference is to. Uh, in some of these instances, it's simply historical events or uh, documents of the period that we would have no reason to know of. Uh, but in many other cases, it's simply classical sources, uh, biblical sources, and so on and so forth. So 7,000, 7,500, and having worked on uh, this kind of edition, for uh, a different author who uses the same strategy. I am very confident in saying that uh, the actual number is probably much greater. Uh, and in many cases, it's impossible for us to know 
that there are references or allusions. This is for many reasons. And one of the things that I want to sort of highlight and maybe leave for discussion is the pedagogical aspect of this, because there was a time when authors could assume that readers would recognize the sources. Um, having, in the last couple of years, referred to the fall and had a bunch of people look at me as though I were talking about the season, uh, I'm no longer <laughs> confident that that's the case. So there's, that issue needs to be borne in mind. So you could assume, for example, that there's a steady decline in the number of sources that people could identify. But the question is, what sort of decline are we talking about? So if the corpus consisted of, let's say, 100 authors in Greek and Latin, uh, has it come down to 10 or has it come down to 1? Uh, what's, the, what's the scale here that's being used in order to understand um, the reuse? So when he uses the actual Greek, you have several issues, which, which I just wanted to give you some glimpses of. You can see some Greek text over here. Um, you can see some Greek text over here, some here, and some here. And if you're Greek, it's OK. You might be able to recognize what's going on here. But just to give you a sense of the difficulty that's involved, uh, because of the size and scope of the work, it has never been printed in English since 1706. Uh, uh, and the only, the most, the most recent edition, which translates only four chapters out of 40, uh, which is for Cambridge University Press for a series that does text in the history of political thought, which is supposed to be the state of the art uh, series. Uh, the first sentence of this passage, which has to do with the definition of sovereignty, which is the words claim to fame, is actually misspelled. And the reason why it's misspelled is because you don't know how to read ligatures. You read that he, and you think it says something like atom, um, right here. Right. So the most important element of the text um, is presented in a mistaken way. Um, but to get back to reuse, the claim by Baudin in this particular passage is that this is the way in which Greeks refer to sovereignty. Uh, I can't think of a passage in Greek where that's the case. If you guys can do that, I'll be indebted to you. Uh, I'm sure there are some that probably get close to it, but the, this reference uh, that leaves the reader with the impression that this is something that you know uh, is the kind of uh, issue that I want to focus on. So he does this a lot. And to get back to my example, you have two passages here which are in italics. As I said, the first one is supposed to be uh, from scripture. And the second one says that Augustine says, well, here's the passage in Latin. And the fact that it's in Latin and the fact that it's italicized would leave any reasonable person with the impression that this is an exact quotation from Augustine. Okay? Now, the passage itself conveys the essence of what Augustine said, so there's nothing troublesome about that. Uh, it's an accurate rendition of a very basic idea. The conclusion of the work, uh, of Baudin's work, deals with theodicy and God's use of good and bad in order to bring about his plan for mankind. Uh, so the, the classic question of theodicy that human beings pose, he answers in an Augustinian fashion by saying that God uses all the means at his disposal, including the bad, in order to bring about uh, the outcomes that he desires. And so this is an accurate summary of Augustine, but then you have the problem of trying to do what McCree does, which is to locate it in Augustine in order to be able to guide the reader and say, where does this occur? Uh, so to go back to Gray's title, now that... A lot of these things are online. You can run a search in the City of God and the collected works of Augustine, and what you're going to find is that this passage occurs nowhere. Uh, and the reason why it occurs nowhere is because, as I discovered later on through now digital access to some other sources, it's actually uh, a patristic source. It, is, it occurs in Chrysostom, uh, but whether because of Chrysostom or a number of other theologians that follow Chrysostom, uh, it becomes, it takes a life of its own. And for about 100 years, 150 years, it gets referred to as though it were Augustine's original statement. But in fact, it's a pretty accurate summary by a theologian 
what a gussing, what the gist of a gussing theory of the Odyssey is. So this is a good example of something that occurs in the text a lot because he will treat things, whether because of the printing conventions or whether because of accidents or whether because these are the choices that he made in styling the text, he will treat them as though they were quotations when in fact they're more like citations and they're not even like citations because they may be encapsulations of the meaning in the text. So you have these sorts of problems and many other problems like them. Uh, you might say, well, so what? Uh, I mean, other, if, you're, if you're doing anything other than an archaeology of this text and mapping the different editions, what's in it for the reader? And I want to say a couple of words about this um, before uh, turning it over. So what's in it for the reader and what's the significance of this set of differences? What I've done here is very crudely, I've aligned the conclusions in three editions. One is the 1576 French, one is the 1578 French, and one is the Latin of 1586. And what I wanted to show you is one of the, maybe the first benefit of doing a variorum uh, parallel edition, which is that without even reading any of the words, you can get a geographical sense, so to speak, of how the text has changed. <laughs> Okay, so you have a very substantial change in the amount of text, and the, 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 the size of the change tells you that this is not due to the difference between French and Latin. So, for example, you would expect that one language or another might lead you to use 10 or 15 more words in order to make the exact same meaning. But this is not the case when you have almost twice as much text. So, a couple of things that explain this very fairly quickly. Uh, one is that as the text becomes Latin from French, it becomes more European and more universal than it used to be. So in the French edition, many of the examples are parochial. There are examples that a French reader or a francophone reader might have understood or related to, but there are examples that, for instance, a reader in England or a reader in Holland might not have understood as well. So one of the changes that he made, there's quite a bit of consensus on this, is to go through and substitute some of these examples. So if you wanted an example of somebody who takes a city and sacks it, you wouldn't use a, a local parochial French example, but you'd go for something that would be familiar to most of the readers uh, across Europe. So you have these sorts of changes, but he also has some, uh, the inclusion of footnotes and references, and almost all of these, all of these footnotes belong to uh, the Latin. Uh, now in those, you get explicit references to scripture. Uh, here's an example of his use of the Hebrew. And to return to my Augustinian theme, since what he wants to do is to persuade his readers that Augustine is broadly right about the fact that God uses good and bad in order to bring about the outcomes uh, that he wants, he refers to Leviathan. And this is of special interest to me because there's been a lot of speculation about why Hobbes names his great work Leviathan. And this connection has never been made, but we know that Hobbes had read this work, and we know that Hobbes was influenced by this work, and we know that Hobbes never uh, gives a positive mention to nearly anyone who was born within 200 years of when he lived, cites Baudin with approval uh, as the author of this work. And so there's a connection there, and the connection is that Leviathan, in Baudin's use, is Pharaoh. Uh, and he's Pharaoh uh, in his dealings with the Hebrews and Moses, and he's Pharaoh in one of the many uses of Leviathan in this early modern period, uh, which is to, uh, sometimes it refers to the devil, but sometimes it refers to an adversary more broadly. And so in the context of the juxtaposition of good and evil, Pharaoh becomes a symbolic uh, other, the symbolic um, enemy to uh, the good. Now, the only way to see this is... So look at these three in conjunction. So you look at the first one, and then you notice that as you move on, it gradually creeps into the picture until it assumes a life of its own, and until the biblical references and the Augustinian references actually enter the text. So whereas it was applied in the earlier editions, and whereas in the earlier editions it was occasionally marked by side notes, as early modern folks do, uh, in the Latin edition, it gets entered into the body of the text and becomes its own thing. This accounts for part of the, the growth in the passage. And 
it shows you maybe something about his expectation as regards the readers, but it also shows you something about his view of its relative importance in the context of the work. Why am I saying this? We're talking about a book that's about a thousand uh, pages, and uh, this is the conclusion to the entire work. And so this isn't the conclusion to some chapter. This is the end of the entire book, and therefore it has some uh, symbolic significance that it ends in this particular way. Now, uh, I just want to list randomly some of the, the, the benefits of being able to do this, this kind of work. So, one obviously is pedagogical because it allows you to move between the languages, and uh, Marie Claire has talked about this, and anybody who's used Percy knows this firsthand, which is that uh, you don't need to know all of the languages that you're trying to align, but you're able to uh, follow the meaning even in texts that are otherwise inaccessible. Um, I want to try to give an example of this, but given my... So this is what we did. Forget about the text because we haven't cleaned it up, but this is an, an example of this alignment. So here we use the English text as the pivot text in the middle, and we use the French and the Latin, and what it's designed to do is to show you what corresponds to what. So Let's say you have a user who doesn't know any French or a user who doesn't know any Latin. This user can base her study on this text, but then be able to follow a statement maybe that's been quoted um, by a scholar in this other language, whether it be the Latin or the French. So the pedagogical element uh, as regards language is the first benefit. But what about the pedagogical element as regards the text, uh, the texts that are being reused? So. I said it's the mother of all reuses. Why? Because first of all, he's the one who's reusing his text about 12 times within a 10-year period, right? So he's got the, this first French edition, which, as I said, gets reviewed in six major ways over the, the course of a decade. You've got the Latin, which itself gets corrected and abridged and reviewed and so on. Then you've got the English edition, which is based on those other two. And given that it takes parts of the French and parts of the Latin, it's virtually impossible unless you know both of the texts very well to figure out exactly what gets taken where. Um, the only way you could see this very quickly is by doing something like this and realizing that you know whatever is here um, kind of survives from one language to the next, uh, but that some things may have been left out in other instances. So if you did this sort of alignment to the concluding paragraphs that I just showed you earlier, you'd obviously see this humongous gap where the French ends and where the Latin continues uh, to a considerable extent. So the first thing that it does is it shows you something about this particular text. Now, in a case like this, where the author himself was participating in the revisions, maybe it tells you or it helps you tell the story about why he changed his mind. Uh, so sometimes the changes may be logistical, as in one language to another, but in some cases it may reflect the changes that audiences require, that events require. This was the French Wars of Religion, so changes within a 10-year period can be pretty substantial, and they can reflect an actual substantive uh, uh, shift in direction by the author rather than simply uh, you know, the, the, the normal course of events, uh, time adds a, a few thoughts. Uh, this is actually uh, an example of something that contains considerable shifts. So you get a sense of those. But then, and more importantly for my purposes, since my main interest is in how they use the sources, uh, it allows you to better tell the story of how the sources are incorporated and uh, used as uh, buttressing the authority of the various claims that are being made. So in the case that I showed you earlier, uh, why does Augustine all of a sudden enter the text, and why does Augustine appear as uh, the source of that specific statement, whereas in the previous version, the gist of the idea was there, but uh, you might have connected it to Augustine, but it, but it wasn't explicitly made uh, by Baudin himself. So it allows you to make better hypotheses about um, these sorts of connections, and maybe what I'll end with is something that I think of as a political theory problem, but I think any one of you who does um, reads and comments on sources will have the same issue, which is that it introduces uh, more readily accountability into both the editorial process but also the reading process. So 
it's uh, not inconceivable. In fact, it's quite frequent uh, in uh, classical literature, historical literature, political theory literature, philosophical literature to say, as Hobbes says, and to have some citation that says Leviathan 1996, and maybe if you're really generous, you might put in a page number, um, and then you leave it to the reader to say, if I go there, am I actually going to find what you claim is there? Uh, hyperlinking to this degree allows you to make this a much closer connection and to make it testable. So in the in this very crude uh, version of this interface, things pop up as you as you hover over them. And the idea is that you could leave this as pure text, but you could provide uh, the reader with access to tools that would allow you to decipher, let's say, the identity of a person, a specific historical event, the textual source. But more importantly, to get back to today's topic, to allow you to link to the source in a way that allows you, the reader, to test the claim that's being made about the meaning or about the association. So I could tell you, for example, that a reference to Cicero that occurs in the first couple of pages is uh, comes straight out of this particular text, or a reference to Aristotle comes out of the politics, and so on and so forth. But there's a different quality to making the association and being able to prove it on the spot, uh, not just because it speeds things up, but because it consolidates the notion that the connections are being made in a serious way rather than haphazardly, or that I'm typically expressing my sense or opinion uh, about something and that you just have to take my word for it because I've been studying this for a long time and you haven't, and so on. So this is a way to start to make some, some gains. The thing that uh, I know Greg has an interest in and people have, have worked in a lot uh, that would really interest me and I think is in, in its infancy is the ability to make more quickly the connections to passages which are like the Augustinian passage in the sense that they encapsulate a thought, but they don't actually express it in the particular terms that you might have in mind. So if I know a keyword, I know how to do a search. But what if the word that is being used in the text is not the keyword that I have in mind, but it's something like it? Um, and maybe it's a synonym that I can't actually think of right now. How do I search for something like that? How do I search for a loose formulation in order to be able to draw those kinds of connections? And you know, practically speaking, one reason why you might need this is because in many cases you're going to have a canonical translation of something, in which case over the course of hundreds of years it will be used in the same exact phrase. But in some cases, and increasingly now, you have various translations of different things, and sometimes dramatically different, so that they're translating the same passage, but you do it this way, someone else does it another way, and I've read you, but I haven't read this other person, and in fact, it's this other formulation that would help me find it, rather than the, the one that I've been using. So I think I'll stop here and, and let Monica take over. Um, and. Hopefully we haven't lost them. <laughs> no, no, you guys still yeah. there? Yes. Okay. We are. All right. Okay, so Let me see if I can put you um, on the screen. Yeah, I will share the screen, and uh, I think that Matt has to change the setting so that I can present to everyone. So. Should I unshare, or no? You're now presenting to everyone, Monica. Yep. Okay. So can you see my slides? Yes. 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 OK, excellent. So I will present other uh, examples of uh, text reuse as part of my work on documenting text reuse in Greek and Latin sources, which is part of the Leipzig Open Fragmentary Text Series, which is a project that we have in Leipzig for working on uh, fragmentary authors and works. And my main uh, goal in this case is to, to document uniquely instances of text reuse, and of course by text reuse I mean uh, quotations, uh, paraphrases, and allusions to authors and works that are preserved in later uh, sources. I am interested in two main kinds of text reuse. The first one is text reuse of lost works, when the original text is lost and we have only its uh, text reuses. And in this case, uh, this is the 
uh, most challenging case, but also the the most interesting one. Because for for example, for Greek literature, 60% of the authors are preserved through quotations and text reuse. So that's why it's important to work with uh, this kind of text reuse. The second kind of text reuse I'm interested in is text reuse of extant works where we still have the uh, original text and we can compare and align the original text with its uh, uh, text reuses. Uh, in order to uh, document text reuse and to um, represent, uh, uh, represent it, I, I'm working on two different kinds of sources. The first one is to produce uh, uh, machine actionable versions of paper critical editions of fragmentary authors and works. And in this specific case, I'm working uh, with the Fragmenta Historicorum Graecorum, which is a, a big collection of Greek fragmentary historians. We have five volumes edited by Karl Müller in the 19th century, with, and uh, the collection includes more than 600 uh, Greek fragmentary historians. And the second uh, um, project is uh, for uh, documenting text reuse within the context. Because in a digital environment, we can uh, represent uh, uh, the so-called fragments, textual fragments, within the context that preserves these uh, text reuses. And so this is the reason why I'm working with the Deipnosophist of Athenius of Naucratis, because the Deipnosophist is a rich collection of different kinds of text reuses of Greek authors, not only historians, but also uh, comic poets, tragic poets, philosophers, and so on. But now, uh, well, uh, yes, um, in order to document uh, uh, text reuse, I have been uh, developing a data model uh, based on the within the canonical text services, which is a protocol for identifying and retrieving passages of text based on uh, canonical citations based on URNs. Uh, CTS is uh, one component of a larger digital library architecture, which is called CITE for collections, indices, tags, and extensions, which has been developed um, for the Homer Multitext project uh, by the um, Center for Hellenic Studies for um, representing and citing Homeric uh, manuscripts. And within uh, the CTS, I have been implementing a data model for documenting uh, text reuse. And I have a few uh, examples. So the first uh, uh, kind of text reuse I'm interested in is text reuse of lost uh, works. Uh, as I said at the beginning, in this case, we don't have the original text because it is lost and we have to work only with its text reuses. I have an example from uh, the lexicon of uh, Harpocration. Uh, in this uh, entry uh, for Banteion, uh, the lexicographer uh, quotes uh, the Greek historian Hellanicus. Uh, the original text of Hellanicus is uh, lost, and we have only this uh, text reuse, as Hellanicus says in the first book of the Attis. In, uh, in a paper edition, uh, this kind, uh, uh, this piece of data is represented in this way. As you can see, uh, we have th th this uh, uh, entry is reprinted in the Fragment Historicorum Graecorum, and uh, it is uh, um, uh, reprinted as Fragment 66 of uh, Hellanicus. So the, the, the text, the Greek text of Arpocration is uh, reprinted uh, and uh, annotated, we can say, as a Fragment 66 of uh, uh, Hellanicus. Uh, we can represent this uh, uh, editorial uh, annotation through the CTS uh, uh, data model. So in, the, in this slide, you can see two different URNs. The first one, the first one is a CTS URN, uh, where I have a, a unique identifier for uh, the entry of uh, the lexicon of our procreation, where I have the quotation of Hellanicus. So this URN is very specific because I have uh, identifiers for the work of uh, 
ARP creation, and I have also a substream referring specifically to the Greek chunk of text where Hellenicus is quoted. The second URN is a site URN referring to edition of the Fragmenta Historicorum Graecorum, where this uh, chunk of text of the lexicon of our population is uh, uh, collected and uh, annotated as fragment 66 of Hellanicus. So I have two different uh, kinds of uh, uh, URNs, and in this case I'm annotating the um, editorial contribution of uh, Müller, in this case is the Fragment Historicorum Graecorum, where Müller cites uh, this uh, entry of our procreation and annotates it as uh, a fragment, classifies it as a fragment. Of course, uh, uh, I can uh, connect the first CTS URN, which is the passage of our procreation, with other site URNs, uh, referring to uh, the annotation of other editors. So I can, because of course this passage of our procreation can be annotated in different ways by other uh, editors. In this case, in the text of our procreation, I have the name of Hellanicus, so I know that this is a fragment of Hellanicus, but uh, different uh, editors can uh, annotate uh, uh, different portions of the text of our procreation, maybe selecting uh, more or less uh, words. Um, here we have a screenshot uh, of the interface of the database of the Fragment Historicorum Graecorum that I am uh, producing, and here you can see uh, in this screenshot uh, um, this fragment, fragment 66, and uh, behind this interface this is the digital version of the Fragment Historicorum Graecorum that I am producing, and behind this interface we have these uh, unique identifiers for citing the fragment as it is uh, uh, represented in the collection by Müller, the Fragment Historicorum Graecorum, so you will have a site URN for the number 66, this is the fragment of Hellanicus, and then a CTS URN for the so-called witness, in this case the entry in the lexicon by uh, our creation where I have a quotation of Hellanicus. Um, so this is the first example, text reuse of lost works, and the data model that I have been implementing uh, allows to annotate uh, the witness, the source, preserving the text reuse, and this is the only citable evidence, in this case, our procreation, and then I have another URN for um, documenting the editorial contribution by the editor. In this case, uh, is Müller, but of course I can uh, associate to this uh, uh, fragment other site URNs referring to other philologists, editors, um, who have uh, uh, annotated this fragment. Maybe at, in, in this case we have the name of Hellanicus, but in other uh, cases where we don't have the name of the fragmentary author, we can have different uh, annotations of the same uh, uh, fragment attributing it to different uh, editors. And this data model allows us to represent uh, the disagreement uh, among different uh, editors. Uh, then I have the second uh, uh, kind of text reuse I am interested in, text reuse of extant works. Uh, in this case I have another example from the Deipnos Office of uh, Athenius of Naucratis. Here in this uh, passage from Book 1, Athenius is quoting uh, a verse from the Iliad of Homer. In this case I have the text of Homer, and so I can compare the two sources. Athenius and the original text, Homer. Um, in this uh, slide you can see uh, a screenshot of the annotation that I have produced. So in this case you will have two CTS URNs, so two um, URNs of the same kind, in the sense that you have the first CTS URN, which is the analyzed text URN, and this uh, uh, URN refers to the text of uh, Athenius, where I have <coughs> the quotation of Homer. Again, you can see that the CTS URN is precise. I have a reference to 
a specific edition of the text of the De Hypnosophies, and then a substring referring to the specific chunk, te chunk of text where I have the quotation of Homer. The second CTS URN, which is the alignment URN, is a CTS URN referring to the verse of Homer quoted by Athenius, and so I can align the two sources. In this screenshot you can see uh, other data. I have a site URN, the first one at the beginning, the analysis record URN. In this case I want these site URNs because I'm collecting in this specific case the Homeric reuses in the text of the uh, text reuse is the text reuse 100 and in the site URN you see OPE data, Open Philology data and, they, and then AHRI which is Athenius Homeric Reuse Iliad because I'm building in this specific case a collection of uh, Homeric reuses within the text uh, of the Deipnosophists. And then the last CTS URN which is the Analytical Edition URN. This is uh, a URN referring to the text of Homer, but I want this because I'm building a collection of Homeric reuses. So this is the Homer, uh, how he's quoted by Athenius. Technically, uh, this is another edition of Homer, as it is represented in the data of his. But basically, here in this uh, screenshot, you can see the two CTS URNs used for comparing the two texts. So the data model, in this case, allows me to compare the two, two Greek uh, texts and represent uh, the comparison. Of course, again, uh, this is my contribution, but another editor can represent uh, this text reuse in a different way. He can select a different chunk of text from Athenius and align it to the verse of Homer. So again, the data model allows me to represent uh, uh, this text reuse in a different way, so allows me to represent uh, a disagreement among different uh, editors of Athenaeus and uh, Homer. If you go to GitHub, you have the link, <coughs> Digital Athenaeus uh, GitHub, you can find uh, a list of annotations of Homeric reuses in, uh, in the Deipnosophies. This uh, work has been done uh, not only by myself, but also by Chris Blackwell at Fermat University and his students. So we have collected Homeric reuses of the Iliad in the text of uh, Athenius, and you can see uh, many uh, examples. Uh, and then also in, in the same uh, repository in GitHub, you can find a description of this data model for uh, uh, producing citable analysis of the text of Athenius. Of course, this uh, uh, this is a use case applied to the text of the Deipnosophist, but the uh, model works also for <coughs> uh, many other uh, texts and uh, editions for representing text reuse. Uh, well, conclusions for this first part. Uh, this approach separates documentation from the digital edition, and most important of all, we can represent different interpretations by different uh, editors, which is fundamental in philology and in this specific case uh, in uh, digital uh, philology. And then of course this model is also agnostic of the format of the digital edition in the sense that uh, no aspect of the documentation of text reuse assumes the XML or even XML, so it, it's something uh, separated from the format of the digital uh, edition. But now I would like to show you uh, other uh, examples for working with text reuse. Um, when documenting uh, text reuse, well, I want first of all, of course, to annotate uh, text reuses within the context. And this is uh, uh, something that uh, is allowed by the digital environment. So this is something new, something different from um, Co print collections of fragmentary authors and works. But one of the goals of working with uh, text reuse and documenting text reuse 
is to produce uh, the so-called authority list. So one of my goals is to produce a catalog of fragmentary authors and works, in this specific case for uh, Greek fragmentary uh, literature. So this means to have a catalog of authors and works reused and also a catalog a list of concepts pertaining to text reuse. In order to produce these authority lists, I have different possibilities. Of course, I can um, use uh, name entities recognition techniques for trying to um, recognize names of reused authors, titles of reused works. But I, want, uh, I also want to use data available in paper editions. And specifically, I want to use uh, uh, indexes. Uh, every, almost every critical edition has uh, um, indexes in the end with a list of uh, reused authors and works. And this is a, a work that I have been doing in the last months uh, with the text of the Deipnosophists. In this specific case, I have produced machine actionable versions of the indexes of the two Toldner editions of the Deipnosophists. So the first one is the Index Scriptorum by August Meinecke, which is the first Toldner edition of the Deipnosophists. Then the Index Scriptorum by Georg Keibel in the second Toldner uh, edition of the Deipnosophists. Keibel includes also the so-called Dialoghi Personae, which is a list of the um, sophists participating in the banquet described by uh, Athenius, and they are important because they uh, quote many classical authors. And then finally, I have also tried uh, to produce a machine actionable version of the last uh, Loeb edition of the Dayton Sophists by Douglas uh, also. And I have an interface I can show you work done. So here in this and the, um, in the Digital Athenaeus website you can find different tools and you can query these indexes. I have produced different tools. The first one is um, the Casabon Kaibel reference converter. I don't have time to explain this in detail but this is a converter for working with the two citation systems used for uh, citing the text of the Deipnosophists. Uh, um, and, uh, well, this is something that concerns not only the text of the Deipnosophists, but many other uh, classical uh, authors and editions, for example, Plato and Aristotle, we have different uh, citation systems. And uh, um, I need a converter in this case for converting uh, the, the reference system used in the indexes by Kaibel, Meineke, and Olson to convert the Casabon system to the Kaibel ones. But you can find a description, and here you have uh, uh, a converter. And then I have the um, three indexes, two by Kaibel, one by Meineke, and the last by Olson. If you go to this, uh, uh, for each one of them, I have a digger, you can uh, query the database of the index, in this case the index scriptorum by uh, Kaibel. I have a dynamic graph for producing a graphic visualization of the index scriptorum data and then an API. And uh, very briefly, this is, uh, well, uh, you can, here you can see, well, you have uh, a description of the search fields, uh, the additional output fields and a few examples. And here you have uh, one example, a tabular visualization of the index by Kaibel. In this case, uh, I have a list of the quotations of Aeschylus in the text of the Deipnosophist according to Kaibel. Well, uh, uh, I hope you can see uh, something because uh, I will try to enlarge it. So here you have a list, for example, the first one is uh, verse 296 of the Agamemnon of Aeschylus as quoted in the, in the Deipnosophist. In these two columns, you have uh, the Casabon reference, which is uh, uh, the one used in every edition of the of the Deipnosophist. You have a conversion to the Kaz to the Kaibel reference, which is the base for building a CTS uh, URN, which is the unique identifier for this specific quotation. And then you have uh, links to Perseus, to the text, to the Greek text of the Deipnosophist in Perseus and also to the CTS front-end developed in, uh, in Leipzig. Within 
this uh, interface, you, you also have the possibility to vote uh, because uh, the conversion between Casobon and Kaibel produces an expansion of uh, uh, data. Uh, and so uh, scholars, students can contribute to this work, uh, disambiguating the, um, the conversion. Uh, the aim of this uh, tool is to map this index, in this case the index by Kaibel, to map this index, which is rich of data about quotations and text reuses, to map it onto the text of uh, the Daypno suffix and then annotate it. In this case, in the first case, I have uh, a quotation of uh, verse 296 of the Agamemnon of Aeschylus in the Greek text. Uh, of the Deipnosophis, I can uh, visualize the Greek text in the Perseus. Here I have the name of Aeschylus, and then through Perseids, and in Perseids we have um, an interface for annotating precisely text reuses, I can start annotating. So I can select the words that pertain to the text of Aeschylus. So contributing, so that's why I need this index, because through this index, I have a lot of data for going to the text and then annotating text reuses and maybe uh, enriching the index by Kaibel or correcting it as it happens in uh, philology. Uh, but now, going back uh, to the Digital Athenaeum, so this is the index by Kaibel, I have the same interfaces also for the Dialoghi Persone, for Meineke, and also for uh, Olson. And I also have a book stream, which is uh, a visualization, an alignment of these uh, indexes. So I can, I can in this, uh, through this uh, book stream, I can uh, align these indexes by Olson, Meineke, and Kaibel by chapters and books of Ateneo. So I can see uh, the differences among these uh, uh, indexes. Of course, the goal is to start with this data. That's why we need to digitize paper editions, because we have a lot of data, in this case, fundamental for text reuse. But the goal is to enrich this data, to correct them as it happens, and to enrich them with precise annotations of text reuses, starting from these indexes, and maybe adding new data. Of course, the other goal is to uh, convert, because the problem of this index is that we have a list of reused authors in Latin, not in Greek, so I would like to produce an automatic system for identifying the, the name of the reused authors in the Greek text, and then build uh, an authority list in, uh, in Greek. Um, so this is the last thing, so going back to the slides, uh, okay, well, um, we still have, I think, a few minutes, so I can't, uh, uh, I think this is the last thing, so maybe I can <laughs> um, finish my presentation. So why these indexes? As I said, these indexes are important because they are rich of data, and the goal is to digitize these uh, indexes, and we can use this for many other editions, and this is a use case for Athenaeus, and use this data for producing annotations within, in this case, within the first seats environment where we have a fragmentary text editor and where uh, a scholar, a student, can produce his or her own uh, annotation. So I think we are a bit late. I am late, <laughs> yes. So I go back to, to the Google Hangout. I stop screen sharing. I hope you are still there. <laughs> Yes, okay, <laughs> because I can't see you, so. Um, okay, I can't stop screen sharing, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, first, thank you. <laughs> and now let's see if we have any questions for either Giannis or for Monica. Susan. I'm just curious, um, when you're comparing um, the um, reuse to the extant sources, um, what percentage um, of reuse has some corruption in it? Did you mention that? 
or can you tell us? Yeah, no. well, yeah, no, I, I didn't mention that, so, well, uh, well, this is a, not an easy question, but it's a fundamental <laughs> question, of course. Oh. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, question because it's important. And uh, well, when I started annotating Homer, I said, well, we have Homer. It's easy. Well, it's easy. It's easy in the sense that we have Homer. We can compare it. With Athenaeus, you get crazy, of course, because you can find Homeric reuses everywhere, everywhere. So that's the difficult thing because you have to decide uh, how far you want to go. In the example I showed, for example, we have two verses. The first one, we have the first verse, which is in Homer, but the second one, mentioned by Athenaeus, is only in the text of the Deipnosophis. So probably Athenaeus was using an edition that we, we don't have anymore. So this is very interesting. I couldn't uh, uh, talk about that because we don't have time. In terms of percentage, I don't know yet. This is the goal of my work. Uh, that's why we decided to start annotating uh, Homeric reuses. Uh, we are still working on that, but it's difficult. Of course, you 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 have many many surprises. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one of the things to stress in your work, and do what you and Chris have worked on, is establishing the ability to distinguish three things. There's a, a standard edition against which you're aligning the quotation, uh, and then there's the quotation in itself in Athenaeus, and there's sort of a third entity, which is the quotation in Athenaeus as a tiny micro edition, uh, allowing you to distinguish the differences in a fairly reasonably precise fashion. Sometimes you may capture corruption, sometimes you may capture a different version, as, as Greg Nash would say, sometimes you have like the made up. In understanding of what uh, Augustine said that goes back to, to, to Dio, uh, which probably would have been in Greek, so this is really interesting. So you're going to get sort of like a complicated set of mirrors like we had when we were changing screens. Yeah, this is why we have a specific uh, URN for. Uh, yes, identifying Homer reused in Athenaeus, because then we want to extract this data, and so we can rebuild the Homeric edition of Athenaeus. So, the thought prompted by Susan's question, which is that, which it, it hadn't occurred to me, because my default assumption was that it's 100% uh, mm -hmm. in my case. but. It leads me to think about what the, what's the standard edition because mm. you guys can say maybe without real justification that you have a standard edition, but one of the problems that you encounter is that you, you don't really have that kind of thing. So just to give you the most obvious example, somebody who uses an early modern thinker who uses the Vulcan, in the Vulcan <laughs> some, of the, some of the verses are numbered differently than in the King James Version. Uh, some people use a Geneva Bible and so on. And so the notion that there could be a point of reference which would be the, the starting point of the text as it is and then all of these others refer to becomes very problematic. And one of the things that I like about this, I'm not sure that visually we're at the stage where you can bring all of those together, but at least digitally you have the theoretical ability to incorporate all of them in a way that you can't do it in print. Uh, in print, even if you have two editions, it's virtually impossible. Um, the limitations uh, are well known to anybody who's used a logo or anything like that. So, the, the, the but it raises an interesting question about what it's, the point of reference would be in all these cases. Because in some instances, you may have a manuscript, and everybody may agree that this codex is the, the place to go for this particular text. Uh, but what if you were to discover uh, an earlier one, or something that amends the particular one that you have. So there, there are all sorts of issues that are involved in making this determination. One of the things that I think you alluded to particularly, Giannis, in your presentation was not just the fact that we want to make these connections closer when we discover them, when they're not obvious, but then what the hell do you do with it when you actually recognize it? I mean, you got a chunk of Greek. Uh, and how do you critically 
assess the sources that you're, to which you are being led. And I'll point out, Monica, one of the things I discovered when working on some initial work on the epic fragments uh, of Greek, uh, that when you actually look at, the, at our sources for other fragments, they are from fabulously, often from fabulously obscure sources that you, I never noticed because they're just sort of there and excerpted. It. And they're from things like unpublished manuscripts and the anecdota. Uh, and uh, how do you think about that? How do you assess that? What do we do about making it so you're not just, you actually can have enough substance to make some decisions critically? It's, it's really difficult, I think. Uh, you, can, you can imagine a theoretical case where you know something that a certain discovery in the in the text reuse confirms, but which was not known to the author you're studying. Right. So, for example, I discover a source uh, which I can readily link to something that Baudin says, but Baudin hadn't actually read the source because it wasn't available to him, and he's got it through some other yeah. means. You know, maybe he heard it from somebody, or maybe so you can also start to see connections where they're not they weren't there for the author to begin with. So it raises all sorts of methodological issues. And one thing that I'm wary of is the danger of thinking that you've solved all of these other problems and starting to, to, to make pronouncements about the, the way that the text is to be read. Other questions? Actually, so the, that explanation that you just gave, does that actually is what you're saying that this leads to is essentially people who quote something like Shakespeare not ever having read Shakespeare and spout off things like discretion is the better part of valor and not knowing that it was said by somebody cowering behind the curtain. So that's that's a it's, it's a very good example and you can think of variations, right? So you know um, somebody conveying a, a, a Lucretian idea before the discovery of the manuscripts. You know, somebody conveying a platonic idea which comes uh, through Cicero, through a bunch of other sources. Um, so you have this sort of problem. And I like your example because it shows that the gradations are infinite. Because it could be popular culture, but it could be that you're talking to somebody who's actually had access to the sources way back when and is vaguely remembering the gist of the, the play or the statement. And so how much comfort you should have in being able to make the connection is a, is a really uh, tricky question, right? Sometimes you, the contextual evidence may allow you to uh, have a lot of confidence in saying, you know, it's maybe one degree removed from uh, the author that you're citing, but sometimes it may be impossible to tell. Different kinds of, of connections because the knowledge that, say, Shakespeare is present in the popular culture of, of Tufts graduate students um, tells you one thing about the reception of Shakespeare uh, or that Paul Down will name drop Augustine even though he doesn't have City of God to hand and he's not quoting his exact words tells you something about Augustine being taken as an authoritative text uh, and in particular with an Modern text, there is so much just floating around in the scholarly popular culture, if I can put it that way, that almost every line, I mean, if you're writing in Latin, almost every phrase by design comes from some other form, it comes from some classical authority. And to say that oh, when Aldous Minutius says, I worked on this all day and all night using a line from Horace, which he does on every third page and every one of his prefaces. Does that mean that he's really thinking about Horace, or has he just internalized this as a way to brag about how hard he works, which he also does on every other page? Yeah. No, it's, 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 that's exactly it. It's very hard to tell. Um, I, get, I mean, one example that, that I always think of uh, is you know, Cicero and Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith virtually never tells you that something's coming from Cicero because he assumes that everybody knows. Yeah. Now, in, in the case that I said, there may be other passages in, in the CDU where Baudin assumes that you know that this comes from the city of God. But then the interesting question is, why does he in some cases say, as Augustine says, 
And in other cases, he simply throws the statement knowing that you're going to pick it up, right? And that's a decision. It's a tactical decision to say, we all know Augustine, the, the great Augustine said, or Cicero says, it's a different kind of move. And so it's, I, I see complication everywhere. And it's a, it's, a, it's a long way of saying that this is, in many ways, it's liberating and helpful. And in many ways, it introduces all kinds of other complications because you have to return back to the methodological issues. But Monica wanted to, yes. to say Monica? Uh, yes, thank you. In, in the case of Athenius, we have uh, another uh, issue in the sense that Athenius is very precise because when he quotes his sources, he mentions the name of the reused author and the title of the reused work, but he was, uh, in most cases, probably he was using intermediate sources where we have uh, quotations arranged by uh, topics, in, especially in the Deipno Sophist is a work about food, so we have uh, a rich terminology about uh, food, cooking, etc. So this is the problem because we have these quotations, very precise, but they are completely isolated from the context. So this is another problem. We have uh, uh, many uh, pieces of information about the reused author and the work, but the original context is completely lost. And uh, Athenius probably was not reading these uh, authors, but was using intermediate sources of qu collections of quotations by topic for names of gods, uh, in this case for food, etc. So this is another problem. Okay. Other questions? I think we've come to the end of our, our time, and we've come to the end of this series of lectures on digital humanities. Uh, thank you all, those of you who are here, and those of you who are not, who are not here now, but have been here in the past. Uh, so I hope this lays the foundation in many ways for additional digital humanities work, which will take place over the course of the next year as we move towards instituting a MEME degree in digital humanities and pre-modern studies. So thank you, Monica. Thank you, Giannis. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.